Welcome to Sagebrush Church. We're so glad you're joining us today. Here at Sagebrush, we exist to know Christ and to make Christ known. And we are so excited to announce that we released a new single from Sagebrush Music, Waking Up, originally by We The Kingdom. It premiered earlier this year with an awesome music video during our Easter services. Check this out. I was lost, I was asleep at the wheel, I was drifting off, my heart was failing, my heart was failing, in the dark, heard a song, it was the sweetest sound that I ever heard, and my soul went sailing, yeah, my soul went sailing. Shot. 
can listen and download Waking Up anywhere you get your music now. Just search for Sagebrush Music or go to sagebrush.church music to find it and make sure to like it and give it a share. Today we are continuing a series called Text, where we continue to learn more about the Bible. Right now, stand to your feet and get ready for some worship.
Things may look and sound just a little different today, but some things never change, like God's goodness and us singing to Him with gratitude in our hearts. Let's keep it going. Born to the darkness I was, rejected and cut off from hope, I couldn't see His love for me. He said He's not who He sees. Get your hopes up for healing, but lies fell away when I saw his face. My heart burst to light. I saw delight in his eyes when he looked at me. My whole world's on fire, alive in the presence that burns inside of me. Now I song that I sing all of my days are filled with your praise all of my days are filled with your praise my Take my song away. My eyes are opened and I saw his face. No one could ever take away my faith. My life was changed the day that Jesus came. No one could ever take my song away. My eyes are opened and I saw his face. No one could ever take away my faith. My life was changed the day that Jesus came. Oh. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a 
shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. There is one, only one, where my help comes from. So lift your eyes, lift your eyes, yeah. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name. So Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. And nations bow, and mountains shake at the sound. Just one name over all Jesus reigns. I know nations bow and mountains shake at the sound. Just one name over all Jesus reigns. Stand against, I choose to pray. 
to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Then nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Then nothing can stand. Just you let my heart want for nothing but you, just you. The riches of this world could never satisfy. Let my heart want for only you, oh Jesus. Let my heart want for only you. You're my Savior. Should I wonder? You're my future, and you redeem my past. Every moment, and then forever, for me, only Jesus. For me, only Jesus. Just you, let my heart want for nothing but you, just you. The riches of this world could never satisfy. Let my heart want for only you, oh Jesus. Let my heart want for only you. For me, for me. for me, for me, only Jesus, for me, for me, only Jesus, for me, for me, only Jesus.
Jesus for me, for me. Only Jesus for me, for me. Only Jesus for me, for me, for me. Let my heart want for nothing but you, just you. I want to welcome everybody here today, those who are at home watching us as well. We're glad that you're a part of the Sagebrush family. We are in the middle of a series called Text as we are looking at how to make certain that the Bible gets into our life. This whole series has been about let's open up our Bibles, let's read the Bible, let's memorize the Bible, let's meditate upon the Bible. Now, before I get into my message today, when you came in in the room, you got a ballot for our budget and for our bylaws. If you would take the time and you would fill out that information and drop it in one of the collection boxes before you go, I really would appreciate that. One more thing that I'm very excited about is our worship team has put out a new single that you can download on iTunes and Spotify. This is the song that opened up our Easter service this past year. It's called Waking Up and here's a little clip of it right here. It is so good. Don't you think our worship team does just an excellent job around here? So good, so good. There's a lot of sagebrush music on, on the internet, so you can download all that, but you can buy or stream it at all the different places where you listen to music. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and pull your phone out right now. Pull it out at home, pull it out in the room, and I want you to do uh, one of three things for me. I want you to like or favorite the song. So I want you to go sagebrush music, like or favorite the song that would mean the world to us, and then share this with your family and your friends. Let them know the kind of music that sagebrush has, and then add that uh, song to your favorite playlist. It's Waking Up, The Same Jesus, uh, The Blessing is on there as well. Lots of songs to choose from. Please, please, please. Do those three things. If you don't get the word out, we don't have a chance, friends. So we're asking for you to do that stuff right there. All right? Let's get into our message today called text. I thought we'd have a little bit of fun to start this off. We're going to do a little true and false game. I'm going to give you a little uh, statement. You tell me if it's true or if it's false. False. Makes sense? So you can shout out that it's true or false. You can raise your hand whether it's true or false. Play along at home as well. First question. You ready? Here we go. An ostrich eye is bigger than its brain. True or false? How many say true? Absolutely. True, 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 true. How many say false? No way, no way, no way. Now see, it's true. 
It's true. That's why ostriches stick their head in the ground, because they don't have a very big brain at all, all right? How about this one right here? To escape the grip of crocodile's jaws, push your thumbs into the eyeballs. It will let go of you instantly. How many say that is true? Absolutely true. How many say, no, you're a dead man walking? That's what it is right there. It's over for you. All right, let's see. It's true. So our friends in Belize, this is helpful for you right now. Squeeze them in the eyes. That would be good. Here's the next one. No word in the English language rhymes with month, orange, silver, and purple. True or false? How many say that's true? How many say that's false? How many are sick of this game already? Just put your hand up real high. Say, oh, that was hurtful. That was hurtful. Just play along with the pastor, would you? Some of you are thinking nurple. That's a word. I know it's a word. Nurple is a word. Is it true or is it false? It's true. There's no rhyming words for those particular words. How about this one? The term, the whole nine yards, came from World War II fighter pilots in the South Pacific. The ammo belts for 50 caliber machine guns measured exactly 27 feet before being loaded in the fuselage. If the pilots fired all their ammo at a target, it got the whole nine yards. True? False? Come on, there's so much detail. Obviously, that's true. Come on, what do you... It took me a long time to write that one up, to be honest with you. I mean, seriously, how many more facts do I got to give you in one question? I don't know what to tell you. That one was easy, okay? How about this one right here? The very first bomb dropped by the Allies on Berlin during World War II killed the only elephant in the Berlin Zoo. How many say that's true? How many say, no, no, that's false, that's false, no, no. Uh, it's true. We're like, how are we going to get those guys back? Let's kill their elephant. Let's do that. <laughs> We've come a long way with guidance systems, haven't we? The average person falls asleep in 10 minutes. Think about that. Think about your own life. Average person falls asleep in 10 minutes. How many say that's true? How many say that's false? How many of you take longer than 10 minutes to fall asleep at night? Just say you mentioned 10 minutes. How many is less than 10 minutes? Anybody less than 10 minutes? Let's see. False. The average person falls asleep in seven minutes. So you people are jacked up. You understand what I'm saying? It like, takes me an hour to fall asleep. you got issues. That's what you got. should take you seven minutes right there. How about this one? The phrase rule of thumb is derived from an old English law which stated that you couldn't beat, <laughs> you couldn't beat your wife with a stick that was wider than your thumb. I'm sorry that's even on here. But that's, that's messed up right there, isn't it? That's, uh, there's a whole lot of sick and wrong to that particular question. How many say that's true? It's true. How many say that's false? Let's see. It's true. We'd like to say, do not do that at home. Do not, uh... Okay, moving on. How about this one? More people are killed annually by donkeys than uh, die in airplane crashes. You've heard this one, haven't you? How many say that's true? How many say that's false? Here it is. It's false. Seriously? Stay away from that donkey, man. It's a killer. I tell you that right now. That donkey will mess you up. as <laughs> we Stay away from that. No, that's Paul. And here's what's interesting about all this funny little stuff that we just did. It's useless, isn't it? I mean, all this information was absolutely useless. It won't change your life. It won't change the life of somebody else. It's just fun. It's just trivial pursuit. Friends, we never want to do that with the Bible. Because the Bible isn't just information. It's not just trivia. It is the very word of God. And if we'll apply the word of God to our life, our life will be better. Friends, we've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks, but do you realize how fortunate you are to have the Word of God in your possession? You're one of the first generations to have all 66 books there in your possession. Remember, remember the first week we talked about the history of the Bible, and we found out that 500 years ago, just 500 years ago, the Catholic Church actually chained the Bible to its pulpit. They did not want the average, ordinary person to be able to read the Bible for themselves. Well, William Tyndale came on the scene and said, that's ridiculous, that's wrong. People need access to the Word of God. How are we going to be able to fact check the things that the preacher is saying if we don't have access to the Word of God? The Church of England, friends, the, the King of England said that you couldn't rightly discern and interpret the Word of God for yourself. Tyndale said that's not true. And so he began to translate the Bible into the English language. And for his crime, friends, that was a crime. For his crime, if you remember, he was burned alive at the stake. And as he's being engulfed in the flames, he's praying out loud for the king of England that he would repent, that he would relent, that the word of God would be unleashed. And it was. And so now you have in your possession all 66 books 
of the Bible. You do realize, don't you, that how fortunate you are to live in this country, to live in the country of Belize, because it's not illegal to have a Bible. But 53 countries, it's illegal to have the Word of God. So I've been asking this question every single week. What are you going to do with it? What did you do with the Bible this past week? Did you read it? Did you study it? Did you memorize it? Did you meditate upon the Word of God? Or is it still tucked away in some drawer? Is it still hanging out on some shelf? That app that has the Holy Bible written on it, has that thing been opened up? Have you done any daily devotionals? Or have you memorized any verses of Scripture this past week? We're going to look at a passage of Scripture today in James chapter 1. Now, this passage of Scripture tells us how we're supposed to approach the Word of God. Friends, if we don't apply today's message, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to open up the Bible and get nothing out of it. You ever ever have that situation where you open up the Word of God and you read it, you're like, that didn't speak to me. Or you ever had that situation where you read the Word of God for two or three days and then you don't read it for a couple of weeks? Or sometimes it sits on a shelf for a month. Why are we so hot and cold when it comes to the Word of God? We're going to talk about why that is. These are the two things you have to have when you approach the Word of God. Let's look at it. James chapter 1, starting with verse 22. It says, Do not merely listen to the Word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't merely listen to the Word of God, but you've got to do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this. Continues to do this. Friends, it's a daily thing. you got to spend time with God on a daily basis. Day after day after day after day. Continues to do this. Not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it. He'll be blessed in what he does. He'll be blessed in what he does. Here, here's what's interesting. This passage of scripture was written by James under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know who James is, right? He's the half-brother of Jesus. And he's the first pastor of the church of Jerusalem. And his church has been scattered. Has it been scattered because of a pandemic? His church has been scattered because of persecution. Christians are getting a snot knocked out of them. Christians are being thrown in jail. Christians are being murdered. And so he pins this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of the first things he says is, hey, guys, let's not just be merely listeners to the Word of God. Let's be doers of the Word of God. Now, what I'm going to say to you is absolutely going to shock you. You ready to be shocked? There was a day and age in James's church where people would come to church week after week after week, or they'd tune in home week after week after week, and then they would listen to the Word of God, but then they wouldn't do it. I know it's shocking, isn't it? There'd be a group of people that would do something like that. But that was the dilemma that James had. Do you sense he's not very happy as he's writing this down? He's like, I'm trying to help these people out. I'm trying to lead them to the right direction. I'm trying to read them to the, to the Word of God. And if they'll apply the Word of God, it'll change the trajectory of their life. And I just can't seem to get them to apply it. They'll listen to it. They just won't do it. And you can hear the frustration, can't you, in his, in his voice as he writes those things down. Now, if you're a parent, you understand this, right? Because how many times have you looked at your children and you've tried to get them to do something? You say, do this, don't do that. And don't do that, but do this. And they do the direct opposite. They do the things you're not supposed to do, and they don't do the things that they're supposed to do. I, I've raised three girls. I mean, I've shaken my head so many times over the course of my life. I think I've got a concussion shaking my head so much. I mean, why, 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 why did you take a yellow highlighter and use it all over your face right before we got ready to take family pictures? Why did you do that? Now, I remember my daughter saying, I don't know. I don't know. Sounded like a good idea at the time. I don't know. Why did you take permanent marker and mark all over your brand new bedroom furniture? I don't know. Sound like a good idea at the time. I don't know. I don't know. Why did you pee in the sink? Why? Why? I don't know. I don't know. It was sound like a good idea at the time. Why do you do the things I don't want you to do? Why don't you do the things that you're supposed to? I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes late at night I'll be laying there in bed and I'll hear their voices. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If you ever get discouraged with your kids and raising your kids, realize this, that God got discouraged too, raising his first two kids, Adam and Eve. 
puts him in the Garden of Eden. He pulls him aside and said, listen, I want you to enjoy the Garden of Eden. I want you to enjoy all of its beauty. I want you to enjoy everything that the Garden of Eden has. But there's just one thing. We've got some forbidden fruit. Adam said, forbidden fruit? He said, yeah, we've got some forbidden fruit. He says, hey, Eve, did you know we had some forbidden fruit? She said, forbidden fruit? What's forbidden fruit? And God said, we got forbidden fruit. This is the forbidden fruit right here. Stay away from the forbidden fruit. Don't eat from the forbidden fruit. So Adam says, you see that? we got forbidden fruit. Eve said, yeah, Adam, we got forbidden fruit. We need to stay away from the forbidden fruit. He said, yeah, we'll stay away from that forbidden fruit. Okay, God, we'll stay away from that forbidden fruit. Five minutes later, they're having a forbidden fruit break. That's what happened, wasn't it? And so God came to him and said, what in the world is what's going on? Why, what, what you just did with this is the same thing that I asked you not to do. Why did you do it? I don't know. I don't know. So God punished them. And what was his punishment? That they'd have kids themselves. That's what the punishment was, right? That's just the way that it was. <laughs> James says, listen, you you listen to the word of God, you don't do it. That word listen in the English would be better served to be audit. You audit the word of God. You, you come and you, and, and you listen to it, but you audit it. You, you pick and you choose what you're going to apply and what you're not. You ever audited a class before? You can audit a college class you don't get any credit for, but you can sit there and you can listen to all the lectures, you can take all the notes, but you don't take the test. You don't have to do the pop quizzes. No, you can just audit it. You can just kind of pick and choose what you want to learn, what you want to what you want to blow off? Well, guess what? That's what was happening back in James's day. They had the Word of God. They were listening to the Word of God. They were auditing the Word of God, but they weren't applying the Word of God to their lives. Now, let me ask you a question. How many times have you done this? How many times have I done this? I tell you what, every regret I've ever had in my life, I'm sure it's the same for you. Every regret you've ever had in your life is because you blew off the Word of God. You thought you knew better. You thought you were smarter than the Word of God, and so you said, you know what, that might apply to somebody else, but I'm going to blow that off. I'm not going to do that. Do you know Thomas Jefferson audited the Word of God? It's called the Jefferson Bible. He ripped out every excerpt, every passage of Scripture he didn't agree with. Now, I don't think anybody's going to go to that degree, but I do think that we'll read it or we'll hear me say something, and we'll say, well, that was good, but I'm not doing it because I'm smarter than the Word of God. And this is epidemic. This is epidemic among Christianity. Let me give you some examples of how we pick and we choose. We audit the word of God. Jesus said that we're supposed to go into all the world, all the nations, and make disciples. And we're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That we're supposed to build relationships with people and share the difference that Jesus has made in our life. And we all know it. And he doesn't just say it once in a while, does it? He says it again and again and again and again and again. And yet 90% of people who profess that they're Christians have never shared Jesus with one person in their entire lifetime. Why, 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 why does Jesus want us to share our faith? Because, because Christianity is just one generation from being extinct. And if we don't pass the flame on, if we don't pass the baton on strongly, the next generation, this, this flame is going to go out. And we know that. We know that. But we say, oh, man, I, I can't, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. That made me feel awkward. That made me feel strange. I, I might offend somebody else along the way. I don't want to be offensive. What's more offensive to you, offending someone or allowing that person to go to hell? Because you know the truth. And yet you won't share the truth with somebody else. 90% of Christians have never led someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ. No wonder Christianity is shrinking on the face of the earth. Those who claim to be Christians won't share it with anybody else. See, we pick and we choose. Let me give you another one. I'll just pick on you for a little bit. You ready for this one? Tithing. Like, that's a good idea. That's an Old Testament principle. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. That's Old Testament, not New Testament. No, New Testament, he says, give it all. I like the Old Testament, but I don't want to do 10%. I'll do a little bit less than 10, you know. I, I, financial records of our church, 30% of the people give money. That's it. But, but they've got a cell phone. They've got the internet. They've, they've got a gym membership. And they spend more money per year on those things than they do on spreading the message of Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? I just find that offensive. $1,000 is what the average person gives to the church. $1,000. And I'm pretty sure that people are making more than $10,000. But they just pick and they choose. They say, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to give it. So you drop a 5 in. You drop a 10. You drop a 20. Anything to appease the guilt. But you won't do what God's word tells you to do. 
I'll give you another one. The Bible says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's right from the mouth of Jesus. And yet I, get, I bet you anything, there's people in this room and people at home that are holding grudges against somebody else. And every time you hear their name, it just infuriates you. You never have anything nice to say about them. You just can't stand them. When you see them walking by, your hair on the back of your neck just stands up. You just look at them with bitterness and anger and frustration. But Jesus said, hey, you should for- forgive others in the same way you've been forgiven. So I'm not doing that. I'd rather hold on to them. I'd rather get them back. I'd rather hold a grudge. And the Bible says, no, wait a second. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. See, every regret you've ever had is because you've ignored the word of God. Every single one. Let me pick on the guys for just a second. If you haven't felt like I've already picked on you already. You're supposed to be the spiritual leader of your home. But most men don't take that seriously either. They don't open the Bibles together in their house. They don't read scripture together with their kids or with their wife. They, They don't pray other than the routine prayer they pray every single night right before they can eat they're not seeking god we go to church but really making jesus the centerpiece of our lives the centerpiece of our home will pass see we pick And we choose the things that we like, we do, and the things that we don't like, the things that make us uncomfortable, the things that don't make any sense to us, those are the things that we're just simply, we're auditing the Word of God. In the Old Testament, 2 Kings, there's a a guy by the name of Naaman. Naaman is a commander of the Aram army, and he has leprosy. And his servant girl is from Israel, and she remembered that there's a prophet who can heal leprosy. So he... Gets all his little possessions together and all of his horses together. He's going to try and see if he can buy himself a miracle. So he shows up at Elisha's doorstep hoping to have you know, something happen miraculously that would spare his life and heal him of the leprosy. But Elisha doesn't even want to come out and talk to this guy. Instead, he sends out a, a, one of his servants to talk to him. Look at what happens here. It says, Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Naaman's ticked off. Naaman's mad. He's like, I can't even believe I came all this way. Guy won't even come out of his house and visit me. I'm talking to his servant. Does he not know who I am? I'm a big shot. I'm a commander in the Aram army. My goodness. And what does he want me to do? Go wash myself seven times. I bathe. And the Jordan River, it's filthy. It's disgusting. There's much cleaner bodies of water someplace else. Doesn't make any sense. He says, I'm not going to do it. His servant comes to him. And says this, he says, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. So he dipped seven times under the water and the leprosy goes away. What else do you think went away when he dipped his head seven times in that body of water? I think some of his pride started floating away too. Friends, listen. If you open up the Word of God this next week and you don't do the two things I'm going to share with you, you might as well not waste your time. The first thing you have to do if you really want God to speak to you is you have to humble yourself before the Word of God. You've got to come before the Word of God humbly, and you've got to say to him, whatever you want is what I want. And whatever you say that you want me to do, that's what I want to do. You you see, here's the thing that's interesting for people who have been around Christianity for a while. You all know more than you're doing. Right? I mean, you're looking for some new insight and some new history lesson, something like, why don't you just do, why don't I just do the things that we've already been told to do? For example, some of you have given your life to Christ, but you've never been baptized. You say, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. 
I'm not going to get in a body of water and go under the water and come back up again. That's ridiculous. Why would anybody ever do that? Well, I guess because Jesus tells you to do it. I guess because Jesus was the example and Jesus was baptized. In fact, he traveled 70 miles just to get baptized. You see, when we come to the Bible and the scriptures with pride and arrogance, how can God speak to us? We're too busy deflecting it. We're too busy defending ourselves. We're too busy telling God that we're smarter than he is. I've been alive on this earth for a long time. You know what my conclusion is? I'm not that smart. You might be super smart. Maybe you're smarter than me. Maybe you're so smart you don't need the Bible. But I do. I will never be the man that God wants me to be apart from the Word of God. I just won't be. The Word of God spurs me on. The Word of God challenges me. The Word of God convicts me. I'll confess it to you. I'm not smart enough to be the husband that my wife needs me to be. Can't, I can't pull it off. I can't do it. Because left to myself, I'm a selfish narcissist. I just am. I won't put my wife's needs ahead of myself. I need something to spur me on. When the Bible says I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that's a high standard, isn't it? It wouldn't even be on my radar. I'd be the kind of jerky guy who comes home, sits on a couch, and expects everyone around me in my house to serve me. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that Jesus came to serve, that Jesus is the one who picked up the towel. Jesus is the one who washed feet. He said the greatest title you can ever have is the title of a servant. I wouldn't even have it on my radar to serve my wife if it wasn't for the word of God. And as far as parenting goes, you got to be kidding me. I wouldn't have a clue. But when I read the word of God and, 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 I, and I start seeing what he wants for my kids and how I can be the dad that my kids need me to be, it changes everything. Says I can't be the preacher you need me to be, the pastor that you need me to be. I can't even be the person that I need to be. So you know what I do before I open up the word of God? I say, God, speak to me. Whatever you want is what I want. Whatever you say is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to act like I'm the exception to the rule. I'm not going to somehow justify my behavior. God, lay me open right now and reveal to me your good, pleasing, and perfect will. I am your servant. Speak to me. you got to come to the Word of God humbly, but that's not the only way you come to the word of God. Let me show you the next passage of scripture. It says, anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So let's ask ourselves a question. What's the purpose of a mirror? <laughs> the purpose of a mirror is to evaluate us, right? There, there was a guy who was on a business trip and he was at the airport and he was trying to find a nice little gift for his wife because he'd been away. And he walked into one of those perfume shops and says, I want to get a nice gift from my wife. And so she pulls out a nice bottle of perfume, $75. He said, well, that's super nice, but I, I, I didn't want to spend that much. Do you have something cheaper? So she pulled out the next size down. And she said, well, this one's just $50. He said, that's super nice as well, but do you have something cheaper? She said, well, yeah, I've got one more thing. She pulled out this little travel size of the same perfume. She said, this is just $25. He said, well, that's, that's really nice as well, but do you have anything cheaper? She handed the guy a mirror. <laughs> what, what, what's the purpose of a mirror? Well, you look at these things, don't you? How you doing? <laughs> and you, and, and you, you kind of evaluate, right? You make sure your hair's right and your teeth are, you know, and your glasses look good and I got no butt and that's what you do, right? I mean, that's that way and you pick on yourself and you, but it evaluates. It evaluates who you are. Number one reason we stay away from the Bible. You ready for this? It evaluates who you are. And, and most people don't want to deal with the truth. So they stay away from it. You see, you've you got to come to the word of God humbly and then you've got to come to the word of God honestly. And who wants to be honest? Mo most people don't want to be honest. You, you come to the word of God, you, you've got to be honest about who you really are. About your inconsistencies, about your hypocrisy, about your lies, about your cover-ups. You've got to confront your anger issues. 
your problems with lust. That habit that keeps getting the best of you. That inconsistency, the lack of perseverance and endurance. And who wants to deal with that? So we open up the word of God and God begins to reveal the truth about ourselves and we close that book up and say, oh, it's going to be a couple of weeks before I open that thing back up again. I'm not dealing with that. And so we stay away from the word of God. So, so here's the thing. If you're going to open up the Bible this next week, and I hope that you will, I want you to come to it humbly, and I want you to be honest. And when God reveals something that's out of whack, when God reveals something that's just not right, I want you and God together to start working on it. And I, and I want you to make it better under the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You say, Todd, I'm interested in this. I, I, I think I understand now why the word of God hasn't really penetrated my life. I've never really come to it humbly, and I certainly haven't come to it honestly. So if you're ready to do that, there's three things I want you to do this next week as you're working through the word of God. One is this, is I want you to read it, and I want you to study it. I want you to read it, and I want you to study it. Look at what the Bible says here, James 1.25. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this. How did you get close to your wife or your husband? How did you get close to your boyfriend or girlfriend where you got to the point where you felt like maybe this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? You did it because you spent time with them. How do you get close to God? You, you've got to spend time with him. And the more time you spend with him, the more you understand his ways. The more you trust him, the more you fall in love with him. You've got to continue to do this. Not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So this next week, we're not shooting for two days a week. We're shooting for seven. Every single day, you have a moment and a time and a place where you say, this is my time alone with God. I'm going to read the Holy Word of God. I hope you'll use the sagebrush app. I hope you'll hit the little Bible tab at the very bottom. You'll find the New Testament reading plan. I hope you'll start, to, I hope you'll start there. I, I don't want you to really start with Genesis. It's a great book, one of the most dysfunctional families of all time. It will encourage you like never before, but I'd rather you start with the life of Jesus. And I put the New Testament plan together, and every time you read a chapter, that chapter will disappear so you never lose your space on the sagebrush app. I, I hope you'll take advantage of it. But you've got to read it. You've got to read it every day. You, you eat every day, don't you? From the looks of you, I think the answer is yes, that you do. <laughs> Nobody here missing any meals. I can see that right now. Um, I, I need the word of God to feed me, to nourish me. I had somebody this past week say, your sermons don't feed me. That's what they said to me. I said, well, aren't you old enough now that you should be feeding yourself? My gosh, do you need to know how to use a spoon? Do you not know how to open a Bible? Can you not read? And if you can't read, can you hit play? Tell me my sermons don't feed you. Feed yourself. All right, moving on. <laughs> That's not coming to the Word of God humbly. That's not coming to church humbly either. You come with that kind of arrogant attitude, how's God going to speak to you about that? How's God going to help you in your life? You come in here and you say, I don't know, you can't teach me. I'll figure it out myself. Well, I can't help you, friend. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. All right, I got to move on because I'm going to preach a whole different sermon if I'm not careful, okay? We got to meditate on the Word of God. You say, what in the world does that mean? It means you think about it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Last week, I gave you four evidences for the reliability of Scripture. Most of us can't give me what those four evidences are. But you felt real good when you learned them. Felt like you really got something down there, didn't you? And then you forgot. Because as soon as we get done and we say amen and we end this service, let me tell you what happens. Are you ready for this? You talk about where you're going to eat next. And then you talk about this, you talk about that, you talk about local events, you talk about politics, you talk about whatever you want to talk about, and you completely forget about what we just talked about. That's why we have daily devotionals. To remind you about what we talked about. That's why we have small groups that remind us of what we've talked about. If you're not reminding yourself and you're not thinking about it over and over and over again, out of your mind, out of sight. You won't remember those things. What gets your attention gets you. We're going to meditate on the Word of God. And then watch this one. We're going to memorize the Word of God. How many, how many verses of Scripture do you have memorized? We're going to memorize the Word of God. There's a woman named Nadine Hammonds, and she's from Tennessee, and she's memorized the entire New Testament. 
260 chapters, memorized every single one. That's amazing. That's an amazing feat. That's a woman who takes the word of God very seriously. But what's even more amazing about Nadine is that she's blind. So we asked her, you know, hey, Nadine, how did you do it? How did you memorize the entire New Testament? She said, just kept reading it over and over and over and over and over and over. She said, I'm on my second Braille New Testament. All the bumps gone away because I can't get enough of the Word of God. You say, I I can't memorize the entire New Testament. No, I highly doubt that any of you or myself are going to memorize the entire New Testament. But if I ripped your Bible from you, if the storm in life came, what verses of Scripture do you have inside of you? David wrote this. He said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart. The Word of God convicts us. The Word of God comforts us. It's the peace in the midst of the storm. Look at, look at what Jesus says about this. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Why does our life fall like a great crash? Because we audit the Word of God. We ignore the word of God, and when we open up the word of God, we don't do it humbly, and we don't do it honestly. Friends, you have all 66 books in your possession. What are you going to do with them? Show me a Bible that's fallen apart, and I'll show you a life that isn't. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Help us to study your word, to memorize your word, to meditate upon your word. Lord, as we open up your word this next week, may we come to it humbly. May you say, God, whatever you want is what we want. Whatever you reveal to us is what we want to do. God, help us to apply your word to our life. Help us to stop being a picker and a chooser. God, help us to come to it honestly. Because this next week, you're going to reveal some things that we don't want to see things that need to change, habits that are killing us, attitudes that aren't reflecting you at all, addictions that are taking us down a path that we never really wanted to go. Lord, I pray that we would honestly confess our sin, honestly confess our shortcomings, and that your grace, your amazing grace would so overwhelm us that we would know we're going to be okay. Because your forgiveness is greater still. And you still have a plan and purpose for our life. And you're still molding us and shaping us to be the people that you want us to be. God, I pray that the word of God would be upon our hearts and upon our lives. And that every decision that we make would be funneled through your holy word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a powerful message. And maybe you've been taking in this whole talk and you've started thinking about all the things in your life that need to change. You start thinking through where you've blown it or where your life is not living up to the principles that we find in the Bible. And if that's you, we want to help you. We would love to pray with you tonight before you even leave. And so just right after the service, if that's you and your heart's been stirred by God, We want to encourage you to go to our first steps room. It's right out this double door, so you just walk down to room 111. There we've got pastors as well as trained decision team members who'd love to have a conversation with you. They'd love to pray for you no matter what's going on in your life. They'd love to help you to navigate how to read the Bible and how to understand it for yourself. They'll also redirect you towards some great next steps in your walk with God. It may be that you need to accept Christ. Or like Todd talked about, you might need to get baptized. We're having a special baptism celebration coming up on July the 10th and the 11th. We'd love to share with you how you could honor God by getting baptized. Or you might not need to just get plugged in more at our church. 
All those things you can do at room 111. If you're watching our service online, we want to encourage you. You can call us or text us at 505-922-9200. And a pastor or one of our decision team members would love to get in touch with you. They'd love to help you with one of the decisions that you may want to make. All those things are so important. But you got to humble yourself. You got to make the time to have that conversation. And you can simply go to the First Steps room or you can call or text us at 505 922 9200. A couple things we want to let you know about. We are restarting SALT, starting with our summer to our fall classes. And those begin on July the 19th. So if you're interested in going deeper in your understanding of the Bible, or if you feel like God's leading you to do further ministry, this is a great course to take. There are three separate tracks that you can take. One is a Bible survey class that we're offering. Then we've got a Christian beliefs class. And then ministry basics. And all those classes meet online digitally. And it's a great opportunity for you to have a better understanding on how to communicate God's word as well as understanding God's word. To get all that information, you just go to sagebrush.church forward slash salt. You can get signed up as well as you can read all about what we're doing. But please make the time to get signed up for that class. Next week, it is 4th of July weekend, but we're still having church. So make sure to be here for 4th of July weekend. We're going to continue the tech series. And you want to be here because we're going to talk about how the Bible was meant to be shared together in community. So make sure to be here on your way out. Make sure to meet a new friend. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week now. Find out about what it means to follow Jesus by calling 505-922-9200. A member of our pastoral team wants to connect with you. You can also visit sagebrush.church connect and we will contact you soon. This summer, we have exciting things ahead for all of our kids and students at Sagebrush. X Camp and Remix Rally are back for 2021 and they're better than ever. Spaces are filling up fast, so register your student on the Sagebrush app under the resource tab or at sagebrush.church now. Thank you for spending some time with us. Have a great week.